humidity 62 percent the temperature humidity index stands at 73 and the wind is calm marilyn monroe is dead apparently from an overdose of sleeping pills but an investigation is now going on and no final conclusion has been reached here is the statement from deputy coroner cronkite on the basis of all the information obtained it is our opinion that the case is a probable suicide for 23 years, there have been those who disbelieved the official verdict on the death of Marilyn Monroe. Sergeant Jack Clemens was the first police officer called to Marilyn's home that night. No, it was not a suicide. Uh, Marilyn Monroe, Monroe was murdered. There's, there's no question about it. Others contend there was a political cover-up. For hours, they say, news of Marilyn's death was withheld from police. The time was used, they believe, to spirit Marilyn's lover, Robert Kennedy, out of Los Angeles. To get Bobby out of the whole scene, to get him out of town. The curtain falls. Brief and simple rites mark the funeral of Marilyn Monroe. The death of Marilyn Monroe was the start of a mystery. Talk of her relationship with the Kennedys enticed the malign interest of the Mafia. A police inquiry was concluded in haste. A friend who tried to find out more was warned off. There'll be a contract out for you. Is there one now? You better believe it. You better believe it. The events surrounding Marilyn Monroe's death were completely covered up by the Los Angeles Police Department, the Los Angeles County Coroner's Office, and top officials governing Los Angeles County. A kiss of the hand may be quite continental, but diamonds are a girl's best friend. A kiss may be grand, but it won't pay the rental on your humble flat, or help you at the auto map. May grow cold as girls grow old. And we all lose our charms in the end. But square cut or pear shape, these rocks don't lose their shape. Diamonds are a girl's best friend. July 1960, the Democratic Convention in Los Angeles. You must admit, said Marilyn Monroe, Jack Kennedy is much better than old uglies with no brains or beauty. Years before, Kennedy had been introduced to Marilyn by actor Peter Lilford. He always wanted to meet the, quote, cheesecake figure, the sex goddess, Marilyn Monroe. It was one of his fantasies. And uh, could Peter arrange for that? One of Kennedy's political advisers at that time, a man instrumental in bringing the convention to Los Angeles, was Peter Summers. In the 1960 campaign, he had the crucial job of handling relations with the TV networks. Summers says that he and other staffers already knew about the relationship with Marilyn. They saw it thrive in the heady atmosphere that surrounded Kennedy's nomination. Democratic presidential nominee is ready for the campaign war. Kennedy was nominated, and at that moment, not only the ground floor audience, the working group of the political artists, and all of the balconies, which were loaded with stars from the entertainment field, it became electric. It was energy that uh, could have been greater than the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. He was so magical as he came to the podium and trying to calm them down to even say thank you. Chills were going up and down their spines and stood there. It was just, just a moment of magic. The new frontier of which I speak is not a set of promises. It is a set of challenges. It sums up not what I intend to offer to the American people, but what I intend to ask of them. That night, Marilyn Monroe was in the Los Angeles Coliseum for the Kennedy acceptance speech. While Kennedy talked of the challenges and perils of the new frontier, advisers like Peter Summers calculated the political perils Marilyn might represent. Marilyn Monroe was in the audience along with, I couldn't begin to name all the stars 25 years later that were there. A 
strong friendship was developing at that time between Marilyn Monroe and Jack Kennedy. Give me your help and your hand and your voice. At the time, and Jack Kennedy wasn't. The attraction that everyone had for Jack Kennedy, I think Jack Kennedy felt toward Marilyn Monroe because Marilyn had the same charisma, beautiful person, quiet person, someone that could enjoy and appreciate the friendship that maybe only a Jack Kennedy uh, could really give to her. Some people of staff said, you know, products were sold by star endorsement. Maybe the closeness of this would be a benefit for him being elected. The other side, of course, is you're not going to elect somebody president that is perhaps ignoring his wife or cheating on his family or something else. Uh, yes, there was concern. And uh, uh, Marilyn was spoken to very frankly about it. frankly about it. There was great concern at the time. It could have destroyed him. No, 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 no! Jack Kennedy was just a young senator when he and Marilyn Monroe first walked on the beach at Malibu, unreported by the Hollywood press. Now they were stars in the twin firmaments of show business and politics, Marilyn represented danger. Jack's sister, Pat Kennedy, had married actor Peter Lawford. In the words of one acquaintance, suntanned, unruffled, with that peculiar impersonal friendliness of the overprivileged. A former cinema usher turned B-movie actor, Lawford was noted more for his affability than his talent. By 1960, on the eve of the Democratic Convention, the Lawfords were installed in a grand beachfront home in Santa Monica. Bob Long, it's say here under weather report, it's saying a front of warm air is moving in from Jamaica. Moderately high thermic pressure will cover the uh, northeast and the deep south. Small danger of fruit frost. Hot and humid nights can be expected. Lawford was determined to please the Kennedys who had enveloped him. 625 Oceanfront, full of his showbiz cronies, became the relaxed headquarters for the president's affair with Marilyn Monroe. People running through in bathing suits and bare feet, surfboards going through the house right out to the, the water, someone sitting out by the pool reading, someone else taking a walk on the beach. It was a nice lifestyle. All of us were sitting there in bathing suits, in a shirt, an open shirt, and it was uh, a nice time. A tropical heat wave! A tropical heat wave! The temperature's rising, it isn't surprising, she certainly can't. It was uh, a relationship, a sexual relationship, for sure, but much deeper than that. If you know what I'm saying. Lawford had unwittingly started a dangerous chain of events. Neither he nor Kennedy had the slightest idea the house was bugged. Microphones were everywhere. We were placed under carpets. We were placed uh, in chandeliers and in ceiling fixtures. You know, you would have to look for the logical place to place the equipment. You have to gain entry also by either picking the lock or, or making some other kind of entry. But as far as the wiretap is concerned, that's not something that the Secret Service uh, in that d d date and time could pick up because you could, you, could, you could wire a telephone five miles from the location. It didn't have to be right there. Otash's men parked themselves on the beach beside Pacific Coast Highway, looking for the strongest signal from microphones hidden inside the house. The conversation that came across the receiver was music, people talking, and it would fade in and fade out, and I then beginning to recognize the voices, the Bostonian accent and Marilyn Monroe, and I heard the word, 
the president call Maryland, Maryland, or Maryland calling the president Prez. Danoff now claims he was shocked to discover that the target of the operation was the president of the United States. The footsteps left the living, which I assume was the living room, and went into the bedroom where there was another transmitter which picked up all the activity in the bedroom, which was cuddly talk and taking off the clothes and the sex act in the bed. You can hear the springs squeaking and so on and so forth. One of the customers for the tapes, Danoff claims, was baseball star Joe DiMaggio, Marilyn Monroe's former husband. Concerned, lest Marilyn's rich and powerful friends might somehow hasten her emotional destruction. But the real customer, it seems, was not in the least concerned with Marilyn's well-being. Jimmy Hoffa, the national leader of the Teamsters, hated the Kennedys. Lured by stories of wild goings-on at the Lawford House, the use of drugs, in the middle of it all, perhaps Marilyn Monroe and the charismatic Kennedy, Hoffa was inevitably fascinated. Both Kennedy brothers had been guests at the house. Hoffa saw potential scandal that could dim the Kennedy name. Hollywood private eye Fred Otash, who organized the bugging, says this of his former client. Well, you talk about the mob. Hoffa was the mob. You can't be the head of the Teamsters Union unless you're approved by the mob. It's a whole big black circle. I want a guy I can look up to and admire. But I don't want him to browbeat me. I want a guy who be sweet with me. But I don't want him to baby me either. I just gotta feel it. Whoever I marry has some real regard for me. Aside from all that loving stuff. Attorney General Robert F. Kennedy and his wife arrive in Tokyo for a Japanese goodwill visit on behalf of President Kennedy's new frontier program. The political enemies of the Kennedys, including Jimmy Hoffa, reserved a special distaste for Robert Kennedy as Attorney General, Chief of Law Enforcement. Hoffa heard rumors that the younger Kennedy had himself now become involved with Marilyn Monroe. Deborah Gould, Lawford's former wife, says the stories were true. Strangely enough, from what Peter said, then Bobby got very infatuated. Then it led into an affair between Marilyn. Kennedy started showing up at Marilyn's apartment in Hollywood, according to her friend, Jeannie Carman. I went to the door and I opened it up and there stands Bobby Kennedy and I go, boy. Marilyn came rushing out of the bathroom all of a sudden and totally different than I would have expected her because she had on this really cruddy white robe that she liked to wear and she jumped into his arms and they started kissing madly. And then uh, they settled down, we all sat down, and we had another wine together, and she goes, which means, Jeannie, go back to your apartment, which I did. The Lawford parties at the beach house continued, except that Marilyn now arrived not with the president, but with Robert Kennedy. I know she was nuts about it because she told me, you know, I mean, she liked that mental part of it. Uh, she was fascinated by him. I think she was scared to death of him because he gave this air about himself, and probably do a lot of people that way. Um, I think he was nuts about her. She kind of teased him, but then she knew how, just how far to go and then just kind of back off, you know. And she was kind of cute with him in a way. But she, I, she was nuts about him, yeah. From long before the Kennedy presidency, Robert Kennedy's preoccupation had been to destroy the power of organized crime in America, the mob. You are dealing uh, with the... Uh... Uh, organized crime and big-time gangsters and hoodlums as we had to deal with, the with them in the days of Al Capone. Robert Kennedy was chief counsel on the McClellan Committee, which in the late 50s interrogated labor leaders like Jimmy Hoffa huh? and mobsters like Sam Giancana. The Teamsters, as run by Hoffa, Kennedy described as a conspiracy of evil. Hoffa and the mob, it seems, were straining for ammunition against the Kennedys. 
Today, one of those who tangled with Kennedy at the hearings lives in quiet retirement in Palm Springs. He took some interest in the political connections of Marilyn Monroe. He is Max Block, former president of the Meat Cutters Union, then known as Max the Butcher. He says he and Jimmy Hoffa heard of meetings between Marilyn Monroe and Robert Kennedy years before. They took place at the Desert Inn, Las Vegas, the very heart of mob territory. The date, Block claims, was 1957. His informant, the manager of the hotel, Wilbur Clark. He told me that uh, he checks him in uh, every few weeks for a couple of days. Up on the seventh floor, I think he mentioned to me a suite of rooms. And uh, that's it. And finally, one day, I'm sitting with him, and Bobby's passing by. And I said, hello, Wilbur. I said, hello, Bobby. And my friend Max Block. Oh, he said, I know Block from New York. And he kept going. So I said, where is he running? He says, he's going to see Marilyn upstairs. True or not, Jimmy Hoffa was certainly determined to acquire damaging evidence against the Kennedys. That is, evidence of sexual indiscretion. Chuck O'Brien, Hoffa's foster son and once trusted aide, insists he did hear about a Marilyn Monroe-Robert Kennedy connection starting in the late 50s. There's no question about other, other people knowing about it. That type of information that would get back to people that were in the midst of trying to defend themselves from uh, Bobby Kennedy. I tend to have the impression left that's been stated publicly that I'm controlled by gangsters. I am not controlled by it. In the climate of the times, proof of moral transgression by the upright Robert Kennedy might indeed have been damaging. Did Jimmy Hoffa have that information? Yeah, I think he did. Uh, in fact, I know he did. You know, he had, he had knowledge of it. When I mentioned to Jimmy about Bobby and Marilyn Monroe, he's, this is what he answered me. So I know he's been screwing around with her for a long time. Did you say that SOB, I'll break his back? Not concerning him, as far as I know of. Well, who did you make it about? I don't know. I may have been discussing somebody in the figure of speech. Well, who did you make the statement? Whose back were you going to break? I don't even remember it. Well, whose back were you going to break, Mr. Hoffa? Figure of speech, I don't even know who I was talking about, and I don't know what you're talking about. Hoffa wanted to neutralize Kennedy. He had a vendetta for him, and Kennedy had a vendetta for Hoffa. No question about Hoffa, and don't you say that either. Don't you say that I'm a communist, or even affiliated with one. You said that enough around this country. He hated him, of course. He ruined him. He, uh, he the kind of him he got killed. I think he felt if, if Bobby passed away, that they'd have to hire pallbearers to, to, to put him in the ground, you know. I suggested that they should sit down at the head of the restaurant and talk it over. To which Feldman replied, listen, there is only one solution, it's to break his neck for him. An absolute spoiled brat, a man who never had to work, a man who had no principle, a man who would do anything to get himself a headline or a headline for his brother, and use the Teamsters as a stepping stone to get his brother elected and he'd become Attorney General. I had no respect for him then, I have no respect for his memory now. Publicly, Hoffa denied ordering the bugging of Marilyn Monroe, but in summer 1961, he did summon private detective Fred Otash to a meeting in Florida. The topic would be Hoffa's campaign against the Kennedys. Also present was wiretapper Bernie Spindell, whose fame rested on his ability to eavesdrop on anybody or anything. What uh, Hoffa wanted was me to uh, assist Bernie Spindell in developing a derogatory profile on Jack and Bobby Kennedy and their relationships with Marilyn Monroe, mainly, and any other women uh, that might come into focus. And the strategy that was agreed upon was to use electronic devices. And the most logical place to, to set those devices was Peter Loffer's home in Malibu. November 1961, Jack Kennedy was back in Los Angeles talking about political extremism. Men who are unwilling to face up to the danger from without are convinced that the real danger is from within. They look suspiciously at their neighbors and their leaders. They call for a man on horseback. According to the wiretappers, their eavesdropping operation was now working efficiently at the Lawford Beach House, where they claimed the president was still having occasional meetings with Marilyn Monroe. Technician John Danoff, stationed in a car nearby, taping signals from microphones hidden in the house, asked his boss Fred Otash whether it was really such a good idea to eavesdrop on the Kennedy brothers. 
what he said to me was, what you don't know won't hurt you. And I said, well, I can get myself killed that way. And he was so-called replied that uh, what you don't know won't hurt you. You're getting paid, so just do your job and shut your mouth, which I did. Otash confirms he did receive tapes of conversations inside the house. Some with Jack Kenny, some with Robert Kenny, some with Monroe, some with other people. And conversations on the phone and as to arrangements and meetings that were going to be rendezvous with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, Jack Kennedy uh, and uh, Monroe, Jack Kennedy and other people, Bobby Kennedy and Monroe, and Bobby Kennedy and other people. Did Jimmy Hoffa tell you that he actually did have the tapes in his safe? Yeah, I knew he had them. Yeah, I knew he had the tapes. We had other tapes, too. Do you think Jimmy Hoffa would have been prepared to have used that information if he'd had to against Bobby Kennedy? I think so. I think so. He went too deep with him. Surprisingly, Marilyn herself had already received some direct attention from the Mafia. In late 1959, tailed by two agents from the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office, she'd left a restaurant on Sunset Boulevard, escorted by a young Italian with mob connections. The DA's men followed them over Coldwater Canyon, concerned that the mob's purpose might be to compromise or extort money from Marilyn. Later, it turned out that Marilyn had another, more important mob contact. Johnny Rosselli, the Chicago mob's man in Hollywood, knew her socially and the gossip about her. His boss was Sam Giancana, the head of the most powerful mafia family in the United States and a man viciously opposed to the Kennedy brothers. This casino complex on the Rocky Heights over Lake Tahoe was one of the places where the mob kept watch on Marilyn Monroe. The Calneva Lodge, on the state line between California and Nevada, was to acquire somber significance in the last months of Marilyn's life. Advertised as a heaven in the high Sierras, it proved irresistibly attractive to entertainers, high rollers from Hollywood and Las Vegas, and gangsters. Frank Sinatra, who was buying the Calneva, had invited Marilyn Monroe and the cast of The Misfits to see him before. Frank Sinatra also gave her a poodle. She named it Math. Later, Marilyn was to take an overdose of drugs at the Calneva and would spend the last weekend of her life here, distraught and apparently suicidal. But that was still two years away. It was the in place at Lake Tahoe and in the in place of the gambling casinos because that's where the clan hung out. That was Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis, Peter Lawford, Joey Bishop, all the top gamblers from all over the world. The Cal Neva was the in place. Amongst them was Sam Giancana, Moe to his friends, boss of the Chicago Crime Syndicate and a prime target in the Kennedy's war on organized crime. He was always dressed beautiful. Um, uh, very high class looking gentleman, you know. Would you tell us uh, whether if uh, you have opposition from anybody that you dispose of them by having them stuffed in a trunk? Is that what you do, Mr. Gene Connor? The kind of answer because I honestly believe my answer might come in. Will you tell us anything about any of your operations? Or you just... Uh, uh, giggle every time I ask you a question. The client answers because I always believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. I thought only little girls giggled, Mr. T. and Connor. <laughs> At O'Hare Airport, Chicago, in July 1961, Giancana and his girlfriend, Phyllis McGuire, were cornered by FBI agents. McGuire was a singer, a member of the McGuire sisters, and friend of Marilyn Monroe. The FBI plan was to interview her about her relationship with the Mafia boss, leaving Giancana to cool his heels in the airport terminal. The incident provoked an extraordinary outburst. He asked me if I was going to make a report of my confrontation with him to my boss. And I said, my boss, who's my boss? He said, J. Edgar Hoover. And I said, well, certainly I'm going to make a report of this. And he said, screw J. Edgar Hoover. And I said, all right, I'll tell him that. 
And then he said, are you going to make a report to your super boss? And I said, well, who would that be, my super boss? He said, Robert Kennedy. And I said, well, I'm sure he'll get a copy of that. He said, screw Robert Kennedy. He then said, what about your super, super boss? Are you going to make a report to him? And I said, who's my super, super boss? He said, John Kennedy, the president of the United States. And I said, well, he might get a copy. But on the other hand, I don't think John Kennedy is interested in Sam Giancana. He said, Romer, he said, you'll be surprised. He said, I know a hell of a lot of things about the Kennedy family. And Phyllis McGuire knows a hell of a lot of things about the Kennedy family. And one of these days, Romer, we're going to tell that story. So did Giancana have something on the Kennedys? Certainly he shared a girlfriend with the president, one Judy Exner. FBI files reveal that he also talked of bugging the Attorney General. Today, Phyllis McGuire says she knew Marilyn quite well. She knew about her relationships with Jack and Robert Kennedy, who she says Marilyn wanted to marry. What Phyllis McGuire knew, Sam Giancana, the Mafia boss of bosses, certainly knew too. What happened to flipping bubblegum cards or breaking a bottle of milk and being afraid to go home? In September 1961, Los Angeles radio broadcaster Tom Clay began to get calls from a woman who said she was Marilyn Monroe. Whatever happened to good night stars, I love you. Or whatever happened to starlight, star bright, first star I see tonight. Whatever happened to Jack Armstrong, the all-American boy? Much moved by his talk of childhood, his own children, marriage, time past, the woman called Clay repeatedly. She seemed to be lonely. As the aging hand of time runs her fingers through my hair, all I can think of is, whatever happened to, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Finally, Clay arranged to meet the woman. It was indeed Marilyn Monroe. I said, geez, I never imagined that anybody as famous as you could be bored or lonely. And she said, have you ever been in one room and felt loneliness? And I said, yeah, I said, I have. She said, multiply mine by 40 rooms, and then you'll have some idea as to how lonely I am. She seemed like a little girl lost, just like everything had passed her by. By now, Marilyn's psychiatrist was writing of her depressive reactions, her inclination to suicide. Several years before, she'd emerged from a psychiatric clinic in New York after being treated for an undisclosed illness. Not schizophrenia, said a doctor, but she was psychiatrically disconnected. Marilyn complained that doctors and nurses had come to gawp at her, her arms bound, a curiosity piece. From inside, she wrote, I'm locked up with all these poor, nutty people. I'm sure to end up a nut if I stay in this nightmare. Please help me. She wrote little verses that she'd occasionally mail to me, asked me if she had any talent as a great poet. And uh, I would read them and comment on them. And one of the little things she wrote, just three lines, help, 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 I feel life coming closer when all I want to do is die. Marilyn's friends thought her film career was also showing signs of faltering. Back in Hollywood from the East Coast, at the start of what would be the last year of her life, she bought a small house quite unlike the ostentatious mansions of Beverly Hills. Under the door, an inscription read in Latin, Cursum Perficio, I'm completing my journey. This was the last act for Marilyn. Maybe she sensed it, because she'd come back to Hollywood uh, defeated. You know, it's that kind of panic that happens when you feel that somebody has lost its power. Marilyn was doing costume tests for the last film she would ever make, Something's Got to Give. Before filming began, the producer had personally rescued her from an overdose of barbiturates. She was ill and paranoid, he said. Filming began as it ended disastrously. She was in a state of controlled desperation, as though she were almost beyond help. Uh, and yet, there she was, going through the daily routines of making rounds, seeing friends, and all the time uh, she was, I think, sliding off. Pleading ill health, Marilyn broke off filming to go to New York for President Kennedy's birthday salute. In front of 15,000 Democrats, she would sing happy birthday to the president. She called me and was saying how frightened she was, and I said, well, I have a little present for you. 
before you go and I had and I gave her I went over and gave her a book that I had had as a child which was the little engine that could and uh, said to her you know look at this story here's an engine that wasn't sure that it was gonna make it over the mountain with all the toys for the children and it did yes, yes. Peter Lawford's running joke throughout the evening was Marilyn's ritual unpunctuality President, because in the history of show business, Pat, there has been no one female who meant so much, who has done more. <laughs> Mr. President, the late Marilyn Monroe. It would be her last important appearance in public. Schlesinger met her at a party afterwards. One felt a terrible uncertainty, he wrote, as if talking to someone underwater. Robert Kennedy had brought his wife, but the president came alone. Jackie Kennedy was riding in Virginia. I can now retire from politics after having had a happy birthday sung to me. Back in Hollywood, on the set of Something's Got to Give, shooting continued fitfully. Good morning. We were very pleased because they felt that Marilyn was ready to work and wanted to work and look good. Except for the assistant director, where everybody else kept talking about her vulnerability and Agility. All he saw was that she always got her own way. And uh, kept saying, next to her, Lucrezia Borgia is a pussycat. In 35 days filming, Marilyn showed up only 12 times. And there was this gradual sense of uh, dissolution of everything, slipping away, kind of like the end of an era, like the fall of the Roman Empire. On June the 1st, the day of her 36th birthday, Marilyn left the studio for the last time. She had been to Dodger Stadium, where uh, they had celebrated her birthday and had, uh, she'd thrown in the first ball. And some weeks later, I had seen, she came over with uh, pictures of that event. And I said, gee, I think these look really terrific. And she said, no, look at the eyes. The eyes are dead. Would you have lunch with me? The producers of Something's Got to Give decided that Marilyn was acting in a kind of slow motion that was hypnotic. I'd be so grateful if you take it out. On June the 8th, she was fired. Meanwhile, Robert Kennedy was beginning to look as presidential as his brother. As their enemies uncomfortably noted, there was the prospect of Kennedy's occupying the White House for years ahead.
the attempt to bug the Kennedys was unremitting. The wiretappers now try to install microphones in Marilyn's home, hoping to eavesdrop on meetings with Robert Kennedy. I received a call in spring of, of 1962 to have Marilyn leave her, uh, her home so that a group of people could come in there and bug their home, her home for purposes of getting evidence on Bobby Kennedy. James says he turned the idea down flat. It was a criminal act. He wanted nothing to do with it. Out of work, Marilyn would visit a park in Beverly Hills, sit and watch children. It was a children's playground, and she, for hours, could sit in the back of a tree near bushes. She would hide, and she would watch those children for hours. The major frustration in her life was that she never had a child. By now, Marilyn was frightened to use her phone at home. Her handbag full of change, she'd call friends from a payphone in the park. As she told Bob Slatzer, her former lover, she believed her phone was tapped. She was uh, very paranoid about the whole thing. More paranoid than uh, I would say the average person would be, only because of the circumstances that led all the way to Washington. She was also scared. At one point, she told me that she was even scared for her life. Marilyn, it seems, was right. According to our sources, technician Bernie Spindell had managed to place microphones in the house. I think uh, wiretapping, uh, indiscriminate wiretapping, uh, is very dirty business. And uh, I couldn't agree more strongly. I think that uh, penalties uh, should be increased for those who uh, use wiretapping without uh, the control of uh, some law enforcement uh, agency. In the war between the Justice Department and Jimmy Hoffa, both sides were bugging each other. According to Teamsters official Chuck O'Brien, Jimmy Hoffa made deliberate attempts to alarm Robert Kennedy. Speaking on a Teamsters phone line he believed bugged by the Justice Department, Hoffa boasted about having Marilyn and the Attorney General on tape. O'Brien says the message was supposed to get back to Robert Kennedy. You could drop it on a phone and uh, let it ride, and uh, there's no question about it. The, the guy listening would, would bring it to his supervisor, and, and they'd mark it, uh, file, you know, for somebody's eyes only, and... Uh, and the word got back. It got back. There's no question about it. There's no way of knowing whether Hoffa really made that threat, and if he did, whether it got back. What is certain is that Marilyn now complained she'd been told to steer clear of the Kennedys. Walking with friends on Laguna Beach, south of Los Angeles, she said Robert Kennedy had ended the affair. She was frightened stiff. She was told that she could not contact now, then, or any time in the future, Washington, directly or indirectly, ever again. To an extent, this is confirmed by Marilyn's confidential phone records. They show that in July, she was making frequent calls to Washington, to the Justice Department switchboard. She complained to friends that Robert Kennedy had disconnected his private line, and that the operators wouldn't put her through. Peter Lawford, according to his former wife, said Robert Kennedy broke off the affair precisely because he was afraid of pressure from the mob. He mentioned um, gangster type of enemies, people that had a big pull and that uh, could use, that had actually uh, maybe some information. And if they ever got a hold of anything like this, this would ruin his career forever. Not only his, but his brother's, who was the president at the time. Jack Kennedy's close friend, Senator George Smathers, says he did hear talk of an affair with Marilyn being brought to a close. I, I had heard, I think others had heard, that, uh, that uh, there was something like that going on, and that uh, Kennedy had told Bobby to, 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 to stop, to break it off. But Smathers heard nothing of any mob pressure. Those who've tried to shed light on the next part of the story, the days before Marilyn's death, have not found it easy. Bob Slatzer, her former lover, trying to publish his own account of what happened, received mysterious telephone threats. But let me tell you what's going to happen. This is straight from my friend. Yeah. You might as well go up here and move to Hardy, Arkansas. And not tell anybody where you are. Because there'll be a contract out for you. Is there one now? You better believe it. You better believe it.
Slater claims that 10 days before she died, he drove Marilyn to Point Dew, north of Mallington, on Pacific Coast Highway. Sitting on the beach, she showed him a diary containing details of her meetings with Robert Kennedy. She had entries in there that um, Bobby is out to get Jimmy Hoffa and, quote, I'll put that SOB behind bars or no, or no what, something like that. Uh, she had entries in there regarding uh, Bobby told me that uh, he was going to have, uh, you know, Castro murdered. And uh, the entries, most of them begin with Bobby told me. It's certainly true that mobsters Johnny Rosselli and Sam Giancana were then involved in a bizarre CIA plan to kill Castro, and that Robert Kennedy had learnt of the plan a couple of months earlier. The idea, it emerged later, was for the American Mafia to assassinate Castro on behalf of the CIA. In return, they'd get back the Cuban casinos they'd run before the revolution. <laughs> Slater could have got his story years later from published sources. However, if it's true, Marilyn had been told one of the administration's deepest secrets. I told her that walking around with that was just like having a walking time bomb and not to tell anybody else about it. Worse still, Slater says, Marilyn talked of publicly disclosing her liaison with Robert Kennedy at a press conference. She was going to tell of the promises that he had made to her, which she considered lies and had misled her. She was going to tell about her affair with the two Kennedys, that's JFK and Robert Kennedy. And uh, I had asked her if she had told this to anybody else, meaning about the press conference coming up on Monday morning. And she said, yes, I've told a few people. And I told her, I said that I thought that would be very, very dangerous. And she said, well, she didn't care at this particular point because she was going to come out and tell the truth because these people had used her. Now she was going to go and tell the real story. She told Peter, this is it. That's enough. I'm going public with everything. I have been hurt enough. I've been used. Nothing but a, uh, a person has been thrown from one man to another, and I've had it, and uh, I'm going public with everything. Hollywood. Dawn on the 4th of August, 1962. Marilyn called her friend, Jeannie Carmen. I can't say it was a whiny voice. It was more of a, a frightened voice, a, a, a scared uh, voice and very tired. She said she had not slept the entire night. And I said, what's going on, Marilyn? She said, well, I have had a phone call after phone call with some woman calling me and saying, you tramp, you, the, you, you uh, no good, uh, so and so. She said, um, leave Bobby alone or you're going to be in deep trouble. At 5 p.m., Marilyn's psychiatrist, Dr. Greenson, was called to the house. On the phone, Marilyn had sounded drugged and depressed. She wanted to go for a walk on Santa Monica Pier, but was too groggy. She told Dr. Greenson that she'd had relationships with important men in government, that she'd been expecting to see one of them that night. Later, she declined an invitation to dinner at the Peter Lawford Beach House, and at 8 p.m., went to bed. Marilyn came to her bedroom door. I was sitting in the living room, and she said, uh, good night, Mrs. Murray. I think I'll turn in now. And she closed the door. And, of course, after that, I did the usual things about preparing the house for the night, and, and uh, I went to my room eventually. Deborah Gould claims that long afterwards, Peter Lawford broke down and drunkenly unburdened to her what really happened that night. Marilyn immediately got on the phone to Peter, grasping out to uh, inform him that she couldn't take any more and that she was going to <coughs> be best for everybody that she died and that she was going to kill herself. Sometime in mid or mid-evening, I got a phone call from Marilyn, and she was quite distressed and said, please, Jeannie, please come over. And I said, uh, I said, I can't. And uh, I said, I just can't. I just can't come over today. And she said, could you bring me some sleeping pills? And I said, no, I, I can't do it today, tonight, Marilyn. I just can't. In the midst of his dinner party, Peter Lawford, it seems, was equally unresponsive. Maybe he didn't take her seriously. So nonsense, Marilyn. Pull yourself together. But my God, whatever you do, don't leave any notes behind. Then he mentioned, he says, 
maybe I ought to go up there and see if everything's okay. I said, well, I don't know, Peter, whether you should do that at this time. I mean, we just don't, I'm sure everything's all right. I would just, I mean, just let's, why, if you go up there and if anything is going on, who knows what may become, what kind of a story this wind up being. Years later, Lawford denied much of what Deborah Gould claims, but he did say he was the last person to talk to Marilyn and that he was consumed with guilt. He hadn't immediately gone to her aid. At 3.30 a.m., alerted, she says, by some instinct, Mrs. Murray noticed the phone cord under Marilyn's door. Usually, Marilyn disconnected the phone at night. So, of course, I was alarmed. I called Dr. Greenson. This is essentially the story Mrs. Murray has told for 23 years. I went around to the front of the house before Dr. Greenson arrived. The bedroom curtains were closed. She went to get a poker. Turning the curtains back, I saw Marilyn lying on the bed, nude, and I was just alarmed. Not long after 3.30, Dr. Greenson arrived. He went round to the side of the house, broke the bedroom window, and entered. He wrote later, I could see that Marilyn was no longer living. There she was, bare shoulders exposed, the phone clutched fiercely in her right hand. Marilyn's own physician, Dr. Hyman Engelberg, was summoned, and the police called at 4.25. However, this version has to be wrong in key respects. First, new evidence shifts events to a much earlier point in the evening. At 11 p.m. or earlier, Marilyn's press agent, Arthur Jacobs, and Natalie, his wife, attending a Henry Mancini concert in the Hollywood Bowl, were interrupted by a worrying message. About three quarters of the way through the concert, someone came to our box and said, Arthur, come quickly. And he didn't realize, and he said, Marilyn is dead or she's on the point of death. The official police report accepts that Mrs. Murray's call to Dr. Greenson was at 3.35 a.m. However, the first police officer on the scene that night says he got quite a different story from Mrs. Murray. It all happened much earlier. It was uh, immediately after midnight. And Dr. Greenson was present when she was telling you that? Yes, he was. And he didn't disagree? No, he did not. Mrs. Murray told us much the same thing. She actually became concerned about Marilyn earlier. It was probably about midnight. I asked them very pointedly why it took from midnight, approx approximately midnight or 12.30 till about 4.30 to call the police. I'm standing looking at two doctors, both of whom know that this is a, what we call a coroner's case. They know they have to notify the police and it takes, takes them four hours to get around to it. Mrs. Murray now says she can't remember why she didn't call Dr. Greenson until 3.30. That I don't know. I'll have to admit, I don't know. 85. So what happened in the missing four hours? The most remarkable new evidence comes from Walt Schaefer, boss of the ambulance company called to Marilyn's house that night. Far from being discovered dead, he says, Marilyn was still alive when the ambulance arrived. We took Marilyn Monroe in on, on an overdose. And, of course, she succumbed at the hospital. You mean that you were called to the house and you took her alive in yes. coma? in coma, yes. She was, she was completely out. In her interview with us, Mrs. Murray departed from the story she's told before. She now says a doctor was called before Marilyn died. When he arrived, she was not dead. Because I was there, then, in the living room. If Mrs. Murray is confused by age or failing memory, Walt Schaefer is adamant that Marilyn, still alive, was taken to Santa Monica Hospital, where she died. How come the reports of her death all said she died in bed at home? Well, that is unbeknownst to me. I don't know. So far as you're concerned, there is no doubt that she was picked up and taken she to She was hospital. alive when she was picked up, yes. Hospital records for that night no longer exist. It sounds unlikely Marilyn could have died without staff knowing who she was. Possibly she died on the way to hospital, though the autopsy disclosed no efforts to revive her. If Schaefer is correct, somebody, unknown, had to return the body to the house. By the time police arrived, rigor mortis had already set in. Marilyn had been dead for several hours. One theory is that the call to the police was deliberately delayed to give Robert Kennedy a chance to leave Los Angeles. 
Some mystery surrounds Kennedy's movements that night. The day before, the Kennedy family had arrived from Washington for a country weekend on a ranch just south of San Francisco. Their host was a respected San Francisco lawyer, John Bates, who says Kennedy couldn't possibly have slipped down to Los Angeles. That afternoon, we all uh, hiked up to the top of the ranch and had a, had a big uh, touch football game, which, of course, is a typical family sport of the Kennedys. Uh, so it was, a, it was a full active day. But two sources in Los Angeles say the Attorney General arrived by helicopter in early afternoon near the Beverly Hilton. 82 years old, but apparently lucid, Eunice Murray, Marilyn's housekeeper, has always before denied any suggestion that Kennedy was in town. Well, over a period of time, I was not at all surprised that the Kennedys were a very important part of Marilyn's life. And uh, so that I was just a, I wasn't included in this information, but I was a witness to what was happening. And you believe that he, you believe that happening. he was here? And you believe that he was here? At, at Marilyn's house? Yes. Oh, sure. That afternoon? Yes. And you think that is the reason that I, she was so upset? On yes, and it became so sticky that the protectors of... Robert Kennedy, you know, had to step in there and protect him. Deborah Gould was told by Peter Lawford Kennedy did visit Marilyn that afternoon. Marilyn was, um, from what Peter told me, knew then that it was over. You know, that was it, over, final. And um, she was very, very distraught and depressed and... Uh, perhaps even suicidal at the time. Peter Lawford's neighbor in Santa Monica, Ward Wood, recalls the afternoon of Saturday, August the 4th. The car drove up and then people got out and I said, oh, there's Bobby Kennedy, and they went from the car to the house. That really is all that I saw. You're absolutely convinced it was Bobby Kennedy? Oh, I know it was Bobby Kennedy, yeah. No question of doubt in your mind. The only time that Bobby was out of my sight was from the time he went to bed uh, sometime after 10 o'clock and uh, when I s saw him uh, in the early morning at breakfast and he was with me uh, all the rest of the time. Yeah, I mean it was Bobby Kennedy, you know. <laughs> well, he wasn't there. <laughs> but Deborah Gould and Detective Fred Otash tell approximately the same story that Peter Lawford made hasty arrangements to get Robert Kennedy out of Los Angeles. As I understand it, he left by helicopter. Going where? Back to San Francisco. Around 3 a.m., a desperate Peter Lawford arrived at the Laurel Avenue office of Detective Fred Otash. He didn't realize Otash had earlier been involved in bugging his house. He wanted help. Lawford showed up and completely disorientated and uh, <clears throat> completely uh, in a state of shock. Uh, one, saying the Malibu girl's dead, Bobby Kennedy was there. Uh, that he was spirited out of town uh, by uh, some airplane back up north, that uh, they had gotten in a big fight that evening, and that he'd like to have me uh, make arrangements to, uh, to have someone go to the house and pick up any and all information that was possible regarding any involvement between, that was possible regarding any involvement between Mal Monroe and the Kennedys whether it be diaries, whether they be <clears throat> notes, letters, etc. According to Debbie Gould, Lawford had already done a rough search of the house to remove any connection with the Kennedys. He said he went there. Um, he tidied up the place and did what he could before the reporters and what have you before found out about the death. There was no mention of a suicide note? No. And you saw no note anywhere near the body? No. I looked around for any notes, and I looked for any documents, and there were none in evidence. Did she leave a note? Yes, she did. What did it say? I don't know. No, it was destroyed. It was destroyed? H who destroyed it? I'm sure Peter did. He told me he did. So another possible version of events that night goes like this. 
Marilyn, apparently suicidal after a visit from Robert Kennedy, calls Peter Lawford during the evening. Time unknown. According to his later police statement, she says, say goodbye to the president and say goodbye to yourself because you're a nice guy. Lawford listens, then continues his dinner party. After trying to call Marilyn back, Lawford and others go to the house. Even though Mrs. Murray can't remember precisely who came to the house that night, others were there. Marilyn has found comatose, and the chauffeur ambulance called. The plan is to take Marilyn to Santa Monica Hospital. But attempts to save her life fail. Somebody puts her body back in bed. A helicopter chartered by Lawford takes Kennedy from the beach in front of the Lawford house back to Los Angeles airport. Perhaps Dr. Greenson really isn't called until 3.30. Marilyn Monroe is dead. We grasp at straws, as if knowing how she died or why might enable us to bring her back. Not since Jean Harlow have the standards of feminine charm been so embodied in the form of one woman. Whatever attracts man to woman, she possessed. Joe Kennedy, the father of the Kennedy brothers, who'd suffered a stroke some time before, heard the news at the family compound in Hyannisport. His chauffeur, Frank Saunders, was with him. And all of a sudden, everything, like, just stopped. You know? Yeah. How did uh, Bobby react to the news? Well... Uh, I, I don't recall any, any specific reaction. Early in the morning, police or FBI agents, nobody's quite sure, arrived at the offices of the telephone company in Santa Monica. The previous month, as we now know, Marilyn did make potentially embarrassing calls to the Justice Department. A telephone company executive, Robert Teox, told a local newspaper publisher what had happened. He told me that he knew that the FBI had been into the general telephone offices and had uh, taken the records of her calls that night. I had the impression that the, that the general telephone didn't argue with the FBI. Tipped off about Robert Kennedy's supposed helicopter flight, photographer Billy Woodfield drove out to Clover Field, the Santa Monica airport. He was going to see the owner of an air charter company often used by Peter Lawford. He showed me his log. In the log, it showed that he had indeed picked up Bobby Kennedy at Peter Lawford's house on Sunday morning, somewhere around 2 o'clock. And he took him from Lawford's house to Los Angeles International Airport. Police sources reported that Kennedy had been seen in Beverly Hills the previous afternoon. Los Angeles Police Chief William Parker discussed the case with Mayor Sam Yorty. Chief Parker told me confidentially that uh, Bobby Kennedy was supposed to be north of Los Angeles, some city making a speech, but that actually he said he was seen in the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Los Angeles. On the night that Marilyn died? On the very night she died, yes. Why do you think that so many witnesses in Los Angeles would have told us and told the police that uh, Bobby Kennedy was in Los Angeles that day? I, I just can't speculate on their misinformation or their bad information or their what they think they saw or what they think they knew, but I, I just, there's just no way he could have been in Los Angeles, unless he had a twin. Isn't it odd that two key members of the police department at that time, that is the police chief himself and the chief of detectives, would both have been of the view that Bobby was there if, in fact, there was no evidence? I'd like to cross-examine them. I can't believe it. <laughs> From the start, the police investigation was overshadowed by rumors of Marilyn's political associations that police and county officials had covered up the events of Marilyn's death to protect the Attorney General. There were claims of complicated murder plots involving the Mafia, that far from overdosing on sleeping pills, barbiturates had been forcibly administered. Marilyn Monroe was murdered. She did not commit suicide. The um, strongest evidence of that is very simply the fact that there was no uh, barbiturates found in the digestive tract, yet there was a lethal dose in the blood. And it's uh, quite out of the question to swallow enough barbiturates to cause your death and have it 100% removed from 
the stomach, the bottle, etc. Before death occurs, uh, I, it just it can't happen. So that's the one thing that the fixers forgot to fix, and that's in the record now, and they can't wipe that out. Clemens is wrong on key medical points. The absence of residue in the stomach doesn't in itself prove anything. However, laboratory tests that could have helped demolish the murder claims, tests that were suggested by the autopsy surgeon, Dr. Thomas Noguchi, weren't done. John Minor from the district attorney's office attended the autopsy. When I first saw Miss Monroe lying on the autopsy table, I was very sad. I felt this untimely death of a person uh, who had achieved what she had achieved. It was something that sort of represented the futility of life. The final autopsy report gave the cause of death as acute barbiturate poisoning due to ingestion of overdose. The coroner said that Marilyn had swallowed Nembutal sleeping pills in one gulp in a period of seconds. Any person who takes any depressing drug, uh, the pattern of death is pretty much the same. They lose their ability to judge and uh, to, to act. They uh, lose muscular uh, power and they slip into coma. Yet the medical evidence suggests she'd taken drugs hours before dying. There was no residue from the Nembutal capsules in the stomach. Other now routine laboratory tests could have established whether swallowing Nembutal was indeed the cause of death. Noguchi, whose own work was highly competent, later sent organ specimens for microscopic analysis. But the specimens were destroyed before the tests were done. That is a part of an autopsy, is doing the microscopic slides for diagnostic purposes and evaluation. And why wasn't that done in this case? I don't know. Would you have wished it to be done? Yes, indeed. And Noguchi wished it to be done? Yes. And it would have been normally routine to have made that kind of examination? That's true. What happened to the medical photographs that were taken? I have no idea. But they seem not to exist anymore. And that appears to be true. A fuller examination might have disclosed the missing residue. Instead, the field was left open for murder theorists who claim, for example, that Marilyn was injected with barbiturates by an unknown doctor against her will. No injection marks were found, but because the lab tests weren't done, the coroner's investigation was inconclusive. It provides no final answers to those who allege that Marilyn did not commit suicide. Crowds of the curious are held back at a respectful distance from the private funeral that Joe DiMaggio and others arranged for Marilyn Monroe. After services in the chapel of Westwood Memorial Cemetery, in which eulogies and passages from the scripture were read, the casket is placed in the hearse to be taken to a crypt on the nearby corridor of memories. They came and they moved the flowers back off the coffin towards her toes. And they unlocked it uh, with all its clanking sounds and removed the cover and laid it open. And with that, a pop, out popped a shock of blonde hair. And I was horrified that they had opened the coffin. And I was horrified that anybody would let them do that. They changed the ropes of the, where the press corps was kept. And with that, these herd of elephants came trampling over flowers, over people's graves. They didn't care where they were to just get one more shot. All in all, it was an extremely depressing day. Dr. Greenson found it hard to accept that his patient had committed suicide. After Marilyn's death, John Minor went to see him. Based on the content of that conversation with Dr. Greenson, I wrote a memorandum in which I indicated, at least, that I did not believe that Marilyn Monroe committed suicide. And that was Dr. Greenson's opinion? That was Dr. Greenson's opinion as well, yes. Minor says that for reasons of professional ethics, he can't disclose what Greenson said. Perhaps what he meant was that Marilyn had overestimated her capacity for sleeping pills. Sometime later, caught on the phone by a reporter, Dr. Greenson expressed his frustration at not being able to talk about the case. I can't explain myself or defend myself without revealing things that I don't want to reveal. I feel like I can't, you know, you can't go around and say, well, I'll tell you this and I won't tell you that. It's just 
terrible position to be in. They have to say I can't talk about it because I can't tell the whole story. Greenson ended the conversation by advising the reporter to talk to the Attorney General. Listen, you know, talk to Bobby Kennedy. In 1982, the district attorney's office looked into the case. Their inquiry failed to support any evidence of criminal misconduct. However, William Parker's successor as police chief is deeply critical of the way police conducted the original investigation. One of the uh, reasons advanced for the highly secret nature of this investigation was that there could be some type of national security problem in connection with uh, the association between the a national figure and, uh, and a uh, highly publicized uh, uh, entertainer. Chief Parker, says Redin, handled the case with extreme and quite unnecessary discretion. It was treated as an intelligence division operation. And logically, it could be so treated because there was the involvement uh, of uh, uh, the Attorney General of the United States. They treated it as a 100% intelligence operation and uh, those operations are highly secret. I began to wonder if they didn't have a file over there on Maryland's uh, death and all about it so I sent over to the police department for it and they told me there wasn't any file so I thought that maybe Chief Parker had taken the file to his home but I never followed that up because I didn't want to bother Mrs. Parker but that was my assumption that there was a file but it was taken out of the police department. But as mayor, you had the right to require the police department to give you any file they had, didn't you? Well, they sent me any file I asked for, always. Surely they wouldn't have gone so far as to have lied to the mayor, would they? Oh, they very possibly would have, sure. It's, it's easier to say there is no file than it is to say there's a file, Mr. Mayor, and you can't have it. Recently, however, the police department released the supposed file on Marilyn Monroe's death. It includes a rebuttal of an ancient magazine article and a handful of detectives' reports. Reddin dismisses it as obviously incomplete. He wants to know the reason for the secrecy. If there was a national security implication, certainly put it under wraps. If there was none, uh, I would see no reason for keeping it under wraps. And frankly, what do you think the national security consideration was? Uh, I don't see any. The story of his involvement with Marilyn Monroe was to haunt Robert Kennedy. If I'm elected president of the United States, I'm going to come back to cities and communities such as this. I'm going to come back to communities such as North Platte. When he ran for president in 1968, an unofficial Republican group decided to buy the rumored tapes. A right-wing journalist called Ralph de Toledano was asked to help. An investigator was sent to California. He reported the tapes were available from a former policeman. He called me back and he said he'd located the cop cop had the tapes, uh, had verified uh, their validity, and wanted $50,000 for the tapes. And I told him, well, you get in touch with this group. I don't want any part of it. And he did. And uh, they said it would take them perhaps a couple of days to raise the 50000 but th the deal was there. And that night, Bobby was shot and killed. Oh, my God. Senator Kennedy has been shot. And another man, a Kennedy campaign manager, and possibly shot in the head. I am right here. Rayford Johnson has a hold of a man who apparently has fired the shot. Had Bobby not been shot, I am convinced that those tapes would have been used. They would have been duplicated and sent around the country to various newspapers and would have had tremendous impact. Woo! <laughs> 